we continue with the second webinar entitled Communities of Practice, a Path for Inclusive Learning by Master Jose Alberto Cerdas Chavarria. We will use the same dynamics. So please share your questions in the chat. At the end of the webinar, the specialists will gladly answer them all. Likewise, if we do not have time to cover all the questions, the organizing committee will send them to the specialist. In the upcoming dates, all the participants from the seminar will receive an email with the answers. Jose Alberto Cerdas is the English Education Program Manager at Pitts Corps, Costa Rica. For more than a decade, he has trained over 300 American citizens on English teaching student-centered techniques and strategies. Mr. Cerdas has also served as a teacher at Universidad de Costa Rica, Universidad Earth, University of Missouri, US, INA, and United World College, among others. He holds a graduate degree in English language teaching from the University of Costa Rica and a master in education earned at the University of Missouri, Columbia, USA. With no further delays, let us welcome Master Jose Alberto Cerdas. Hello, hello. Um, as Tobias uh, mentioned, my name is Jose Alberto Cerdas. It's a great pleasure to, to be here with you all. And I want to like, um, I want to express my appreciation uh, for this invite that um, UNED um, graciously extended so that I can share with you some of my experiences and, uh, and the, my observations throughout Costa Rica in multiple classrooms uh, as part of my job. I visit high schools, I visit universities, I visit elementary schools. I observe teachers on a daily basis. And also, of course, I've, um, I've read and I've uh, researched on the topic that we are going to talk about today. Um, since we're talking about communities of practice, um, I decided to share with you a little bit about the work we do with communities of practice and explore a little bit more this topic. So please uh, let me know if you are able to see my screen right now. Yes, we can see it, Jose. Okay, thank you, Tobias, thank you. Okay, so um, let me start with, uh, with a basic, basic definition of a community of practice. And by the way, I want you to, to write your questions in the chat as I speak, and I will try to, to address the questions as, as I speak, because for me, those questions are super important for me, what you think and what you want to know or your comments are, are also very important. So please uh, type your questions and I'll try to uh, address your questions as, as I go with the presentation. Communities of practice. Okay. A community of practice is basically, let me put this in presentation mode so that it's uh, a lot easier for you to, to see the, the screen. A community of practice is simply a group of people with a common interest who mutually nurture their professional development. And we have to differentiate here between just a group of people with a common interest, like a group of teachers, or it can be a group of, of, of or mechanics or, or, or soccer players, whatever you want to mention. But the difference between just a group of people with a common interest and a community of practice is that in a community of practice, you share that desire and that willingness to nurture your professional development mutually as a group. Okay, having said that, um, I want to conceptualize this a little bit more. Okay, there are multiple ways of holding a community of practice. What is the most traditional one, which is face-to-face? Um, and right now it's a little bit difficult because of the circumstances, but, uh, but you, can, you can meet as a group of teachers and share your experiences, your best practices, share assessment practices, share uh, materials, information, challenges, and that can be done um, when, when you're like in a free time, in a break or, or in, in, 
in, uh, in any space that you have in your institution. Right now, it's super common to have virtual communities of practice because of, of, of the COVID pandemic. And, and, and this pandemic has brought a lot of changes as, as Anna mentioned before. So mo many of the communities of practice we're having right now is, is virtual. Also, you can have institutional communities of practice. And also there are national communities of practice. Most of them are like, are virtual communities of practice and global communities of practice. Right now, I'm not being able to see your faces. So, uh, okay. Now, why are we talking about communities of practice? What is the importance of communities of practice? Many times, many times, uh, teachers feel or believe that they don't have resources to develop professionally. However, most of the resources that we try to tap on in a community of practice are local resources. The importance of a community of practice is that it creates synergy between the teachers. It is not the same working individually than working as a team. It's not the same facing the challenges of a school on a daily basis by yourself as many teachers do, as most of us do, probably because that's the way we were like taught at the university, probably because uh, we are afraid of sharing or afraid of, of sometimes telling others that, that we are facing challenges in the classroom. But when we get together and we share experiences and we share challenges and we share best practices and materials, then that synergy creates a more powerful teacher, a more uh, complete teacher as a whole. The second point is that it creates inclusion or it promotes inclusion because the community of practice is about everybody in the institution or everybody in, in the community, meaning that everybody can provide experiences, everybody can provide knowledge, everybody is important. So it's not about inviting a guest speaker to come to your institution to talk about things that maybe you already know, but you don't share with other teachers. So it is a lot more beneficial and even sustainable to promote meetings or, or organize events where the local teachers present among yourselves or among themselves. And that helps also create self-esteem among the teacher body, okay? So we can have continual learning opportunities through communities of teachers because we don't have to like wait for sometimes approval of, of budgets to pay people coming from outside and give us a talk about, I don't know, about uh, let's say classroom management or, or new, new technologies or, or the use of, of new technologies because we have experts within the institutions that can help like the rest of the team in those different uh, subjects. Also, communities of teachers offer spaces for reflection and feedback. And I would like to ask, uh, to ask all of you, when was the last time you could, you observe a teacher and gave feedback to a colleague, to a peer? When was the last time that you were invited by a peer to observe his or her class and provide feedback? And, and, and the thing I'm asking, the, the reason I'm asking this question is because when we are observed, it's usually by a supervisor, by some, somebody who is above our level in terms of, of authority in the institution. And that observation is usually, uh, I don't want to say biased, but it doesn't provide comfort. It doesn't provide true feedback that we want to hear uh, because it's, it's a little bit uncomfortable to be observed when we are not inviting the observer. But when we invite somebody to observe us, 
And we ask that person, that colleague, look, please come to my class, observe my class and tell me what things I, I have to improve, what I need to improve. And tell me what things I'm doing well also, what are my strengths as a teacher. And then we sit together after that observation and we receive feedback. It's totally different. And, and we can reflect on that feedback and, and then continue doing the things we're doing well and change the things we need to change and improve what we need to improve. So the, 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 the community of practice has that, provides that opportunity for teachers to improve as a community, as, as members of the same team, but there has to be trust and there has to be confidence between teachers in order to, to like invite somebody to observe you in the classroom because it's not very natural to be observed and still feel at ease. But if, if that is done by a colleague, by a friend, by somebody you trust, then it's a lot, a lot more productive. Also, um, community of practice strengthen the social cultural competences because it fosters collaborative learning. When, when we learn, and, and this is important because we ask the students, you need to work as a team, you need to collaborate, but are we teachers collaborating, collaborating amongst ourselves? Are we helping each other? Are we contributing with materials? Are we contributing with new practices? Are we contributing with, with some feedback to, to our colleagues? If we are doing so, then we are in a position to ask our students to do the same. But if we are not doing that, maybe it is time for us to reflect and to see if we should start creating and participating in communities of practice. Um, I'm not being able to see your questions. If you have questions, please type them right away because I want to, to, to be able to answer your questions as I develop the presentation. You might be wondering what, what a community of, how community of practice look like. There are a few examples here. And this one is from Centro Espiral Maná. Centro Espiral Maná is a community of teachers that has been um, promoted by Mary Scholz, that, that she's a, a teacher trainer who lives in Costa Rica. She's like a very influential teacher and trainer. And somehow teachers who have gone through training with her have created a community, a community of practice that keeps in touch. And as a community, we share lots of, of resources, lots of materials, lots of information, lots of best practices. So this is an example. I have more examples here. Uh, and, and I put this example here because it's not only about teaching. For example, in sports, um, this is a community of practice of mountain biking. In mountain biking, well, this is a picture just for, for, the exam, for the sake of the example, but in mountain biking, uh, I am an avid mountain biker and we get together and we, uh, we not only go mountain biking, we explore new places, new routes, new parks, new rivers uh, and all of that. But also we talk about what is the best bike that I could buy? Where can I fix my bike? What is the best diet I can follow? Uh, should I take vitamins? Should I take a natural product? Should I, you know, we learn as a group, as a team, we inform each other and we grow as, as, as a community of practice. So there are multiple communities of practice that we can, um, that we can have. It's not only about teaching. I remember that like 50 years ago, our farmers, our country people, our countrymen used to sit together after cultivating the land and they talked about the season, they talked about the climate, they talked about the droughts, they talked about the floods, they talked about the seeds, they discussed potential uh, um, sowing systems. And that was a community of, of, of practice. And it happened like 50 years ago with people who were simple farmers. I say simple farmers, but they were like super, super advanced in terms of communication because they, they communicate with each other. And I wonder why nowadays teachers hardly ever communicate amongst teachers. Um, and I want to think of a community of practice where it's not only between English teachers, 
because we can also communicate and share best practices with the math teacher, with the physical education teacher, with the science teacher, with the social studies teachers, because as Anna Campos said before, uh, as teachers, we, we are more than English teachers, we are educators and we need to be connected and we, we need to have uh, different types of knowledge. And again, it's not that we're going to teach math in English, but we need to inspire students to learn through different ways and to take advantage of all the resources they have at the institution and outside the institution. So if we were able to connect with all the teachers, not only with the English teachers and say, hey, what do you do? In, or, or how can we collaborate? How can we collaborate between the physical education teacher and the English teacher, for example? That would be great because then we could have we could take the, 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 the English class outside of the English classroom and, and have them do sports in English and have students do science in English and have students do social studies in English. And I think that is the power of communities of practice, the ability that we have to connect as teachers and then bring that connection and, and, and have long lasting effects and an impact on the students. So, I think that's why it is crucial that we cultivate, create, promote, and participate in communities of practice. Here are some principles of communities of practice. Principle number one is we are our own best resource. And I said before, we have to believe in ourselves as teachers. We have to trust ourselves as teachers, and we have to connect as teachers. Uh, once we connect, then we can start creating that synergy I mentioned before. Everybody has something to share. As teachers, we are not all equal. We don't have exactly the same skills, the same knowledge, the same abilities, not even the same behaviors. Some teachers in a community are experts in writing, and some teachers are experts in in pronunciation, some teachers are really good at creating materials, resources. Some teachers are really excellent in technology, in the use of technology. Technology. So when we get together and we share our skills, then we can learn a bit from each other and we can develop as, 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 a, as a whole body of teachers and I think Anna Campos mentioned that before, knowledge develops and grows through environmental interactions. We as teachers sometimes do not improve our English skills because we spend all our lives teaching students in, with routines, with exercises, with, uh, with, with contents that are fixed, uh, that are limited but sometimes we need to, to develop ourselves, develop my own learning. So those environmental interactions is what is going to provide us some growth and some development as professionals. Perfection is not an ideal, but an absurd. And I think that that idea that we have to speak perfectly is some times a boundary and, and hinders our learning. Because if we were able to reflect and accept that we have limitations, that we are not perfect, that we are in the making, that as Anna said before, that we are continual learners, that we are learning always, then we would be humble enough to ask for help and to connect and say, hey, can you teach me how to do that? I've seen that you, that you make beautiful presentations using, uh, I don't know, a Moodle, using Powtoon, using um, Canva, using Genially. Teach me how to do that. Let's, but don't teach me, teach three of us. Let's get together as a group. Then we would be learning from our peers 
in a very friendly environment, okay? Um, learning is a never ending journey. If we as teachers, as role models, show our students that we are also learning, then that could be a motivation for the students to become avid learners and understand that whatever they do, whatever step they take to improve their English in this case is going to be worth it because perfection is not what we're looking for. Perfection is something that is out of the question. We want improvement, we want growth and growth can take different shapes, different forms and also the, this, the, the speed of learning is different for everybody. And once we accept that, we, once we understand that, we can feel more comfortable with, within a community of teachers. Hmm. How can we create a community of teachers? It requires some leadership sometimes. And leadership doesn't come from uh, top down. It can come from any place, uh, depending on the organization and depending on the group. Because I'm, I understand that in this conference, we have also students. Students can organize also as a community of students. It wouldn't be a community of teachers, but it could be a community of students who want to improve their skills also. Right now, for example, UNED, has students from Upala, Limon, Guapiles, Zambito, uh, Guanacaste. But those students can also create a community, an online community, and share challenges, share learnings, share you know, movies, share music, uh, and, and, and start chatting, start talking about among themselves, and, and have a community of practice, create a conversation club. A conversation club can be for students and can be for teachers. Teachers can meet on Fridays after, you know, after the last class or whatever, and with a cup of coffee or any drink they, of their choice and talk about different topics in order to practice their English. Students can do the same. Students can connect. Now that we have um, Zoom, Skype, WhatsApp, they can connect and, and talk in English for, 30 minutes for 45 minutes for one hour, just choose a topic and, 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 and rehearse what, what, what they know or what they are doing. But in order to create that community, we need somebody to start, to, to start steering the community. It can be the principal of the school. It can be the, the it could be the English coordinator. It can be the academic director. Or it can be a, a teacher that says, hey, guys, uh, let's, let's meet through Zoom and let's start by discussing uh, how to best teach students with special needs. Or let's start discussing um, how to do classroom management in an effective way. Or let's start talking about um, uh, how to teach pronunciation or phonology or writing because we all do the same, but in rather different manners sometimes. So it would be really nice to do that, but we need a leader. And something important about it is have consistency, meet on, on a, in a uniform basis. It can be once a month. It can be twice a month. It can be, could be once a week. It all depends on, on what you choose, but be consistent, okay? The second thing is organize, secure spaces, resource, logistics, and set goals. And when I say when I when I say goals, try to, to not create uh, try to create realistic goals, achievable goals. Okay, let's meet, you know, in the next three months, once a week or once a month. Because if you're too busy and you say, let's meet once a week and then you find out that you can't, then the morale of the group may, may fall. So start with maybe once a week and start slow, start with few members. You don't have to inv involve everybody. 
I mean, it is nice if everybody wants to participate in a community of practice, but it's better to grow than to decrease in the numbers. So start slow, start with a few members, and then try to uh, involve more and more people. Something that I, I want to like emphasize in a community of practice is that not everybody has to participate at the same level or at the same time. You can just be observers, listeners. You can just be participants. And then as time goes by, you will find your space in the community of practice. But at the same time, I want to encourage you to share what you know, to share what you are, because we don't share for two reasons, because we might have not much, much confidence in our capacities or because, because we feel that, that people may not be interested in what we know. However, reality is that your colleagues know a lot and they can share with you what they know. But at the same time, you also as an individual have a lot to share with others. And I think it's about time to start sharing with others. The reason I wanted to, to present this idea of community of practice is because the name of the conference is uh, Unifying English Teaching, Teaching Communities of Practice. And I was wondering, okay, if we're talking about unifying communities of practice, we first need to know what a community of practice is and also how to start a community of, a community of practice, how to participate in a community of practice and what the principles of a community of practice is. Uh, one of the most beautiful things that I have experienced as a member of a community of practice is providing feedback to teachers, sitting in a classroom and, and, and receiving feedback from teachers. Sitting in a classroom, silent in the back of the classroom and observing a teacher from beginning to end of a class and then delivering feedback to that teacher is absolutely beautiful and valuable. And at the same time, receiving that gift, receiving the gift of, of feedback, having a colleague, having a friend, having a peer telling me, Jose, uh, I, I, I enjoy the class because you always start with something positive. You don't want to start giving feedback with the negative, uh, not a negative, but, but what we call uh, areas of improvement. We start with areas of strength that the teacher has. And it's, it's so nice to, to hear like, uh, I really like the way you opened the class. I enjoyed the warm up that you created for the students. They were very engaged in the dancing part when they were dancing and, and touching or, or showing different parts of the body as you, as you uh, prompted to say, when you said, hand everybody raise their hand, when you said left hand, everybody, you know. So, having that feedback. And also, I like the energy you put into the class. I like this and that, being specific. And then receiving feedback on, on the areas I can improve and, and telling, okay, I think you could also have, uh, when you were given instructions, for example, when you're given instructions, Maybe you shouldn't have given them the paper because they will start. They start reading the paper, and then the the students didn't pay attention to you because they start reading the paper. So maybe next time you first talk, you first give instructions, and then you give them the handouts. Also, in the instructions, try to give them in a small chunks. Don't give all the instructions together because they forget. Maybe tell them piece by piece, what they need to do, and then have somebody repeat instructions, whatever. So receiving that gift from a teacher, from a colleague who is not supervising you, who is not going to, to go and tell others, oh, Jose doesn't know how to teach a class. No, he is or she is going to give me the feedback that she observed in, in, in a moment of confidence, in a moment of, of comfort, in a moment of trust in a moment of even of love. So that is for me, one of the biggest treasures of a community of practice, sharing with your peers uh, the result of an observation, 
because of observations are powerful tools for improvement and, and, and assessment. Uh, so there, there are multiple benefits of a community of practice. I'm going to stop here to listen to your questions or to read your questions or comments. Hi, Jose. Hola. Hello. Hello. <laughs> we have some comments for you. Um, Marilyn Cristina says, it's communication, not a competition, just as you said. And she says, it would be great to help each other. A lot of things can change. Milagro Sequeira. Can, can I stop with that comment? Can I stop with yeah, this sure, comment? Yeah, uh, sure, sure, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, who made that comment again? Is, is... Uh, um, it was from Marilyn Cristina. And, and repeat the comment, please. It is collaboration or communication? It is about, it's, it's communication, not a competition. Thank it you. Will, it will be great to help each other. A lot of things can change. Thank you, absolutely. I, I love that comment. It oh, is oh, about- okay. Mr. Mr. This is Ken Arthur. <laughs> Okay, it, it's about communication and collaboration. Thank you. It's not competition. We need, we originally need as teachers to eliminate that sense of, of competition, which for me stems for, from fear. Fear is the, the, for me, is the fuel for competition because I don't need to compete. I don't need to show anybody that I am better or worse than anybody else. I'm here as, as a teacher to help others. That's why we became teachers because we wanted to help students and to collaborate. And, and, and the best way to start is let's help each other as teachers. So thank you for that comment. I think that is the essence of, of a community of practice, communication and collaboration. Uh -huh. next, next comment, please, or question. Okay, we have two more comments. They are pretty much related. Milagro Sequeira says, the principle that really gets me in a, is about the perfection. And that is right, that is right. We cannot pretend to do everything right because even though we are teachers, we always learn something new. That's Milagros. And Viridiana Alvarado says, I agree with you. We can learn a lot from others. However, sometimes we feel ashamed to ask for help, accepting, that perfection is not the ultimate goal, but improving gives us strength to keep on. Thank you for those comments. Yes, uh, again, uh, sometimes we are ashamed of asking for help. And as teachers, again, we have to, the problem with, 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 with teachers, and from my perspective, from my understanding, is that we have the burden of teaching others and teaching in times that we know and that we have to, to transmit or to transfer knowledge. And for me, that is one more myth of teaching uh, following, uh, or uh, I, I just want to piggyback on Anna Campos, myths about teaching. The role of teachers is not to transmit knowledge, because if I want to give others my knowledge, I'm going to provide a very limited amount of knowledge because I know very little. I just know what I have learned. But, it's, but as a teacher, my role is to inspire others to learn and to facilitate the process of learning for others. And those others might include my colleagues, my peers, and if I understand that, then I am open to also learning from others and also open to be humble, not to be ashamed of asking for help. So um, the myth that we need to teach others, I think sometimes kills us because it puts, puts a lot of pressure on me to prepare something that I can teach others. But of course, of course we are, professional teachers, of course, we went to the university, of course, we, we know a little bit of the English language and that's what we facilitate. But if I 
intend to teach others what I know, I'm going to automatically limit my students. But if I instead, instead inspire them to go out and learn in the environment, and learn at home, and learn from, from social interactions, from technology, from movies, from music, from traveling, from uh, you name it, then I will be actually facilitating the process of learning. And that's what people need because we don't need to teach what I know again, because that would be somehow castrating others in, in their quest for learning. Uh, I think we always say that we want our children to be better than we are in terms of knowledge, in terms of growth, in terms of professional development, even in, term, even in terms of, of, of material, we want our children to be better than we are. And, and that's, that same applies for, for our students. They should be, they should go a lot and go a lot further than, than we have gone and that we have grown. And that's the, the real mission of a teacher. So uh, let's pave the way for them to walk. Let's not just hold them from our hand on, our, on their hands and walk with them because we might actually delay their arrival to their future. Uh, Romy, Jose, Jose, you have you have lots of comments actually. Um, let's see. Mariana Ortiz says it's very important to be humble. Thank you for reminding us to be receptive to comments that can make us better teachers. Melissa Gonzalez says, I totally agree. A community of practice is built on an environment of confidence. That's the key. And Wai San Hin says, Mr. Cerdas, do you purposely seek for members to establish a COP? How do you break the ice with those people who do not understand this concept? Thanks for sharing your experience. Can you repeat the last question, please, for me? It says, uh, do you purposely seek for members to establish a COP? How do you break the ice with those people who do not understand this concept? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. Um, okay, there are multiple ways of starting a community of practice. Uh, there are like the official ways to call it, to call it somehow. And it is when, when the coordinator of a department says, Hey, we want to start, and you don't need to call it a community of practice. You don't need to call to say, hey, let's form a community of practice, because sometimes even labels may um, create some bias or create some fears or create some reactions that you don't want. So you don't need, you don't have to say this is a community of practice. What you have to what you could start with is, hey guys, uh, why don't we sit together? Uh, and start speaking in English because I really need to improve my English. And being humble helps, like asking for help. Hey, I, can you help me improve my English? I've noticed that you speak very good English. So uh, can we sit uh, maybe in the break, in the teacher's lounge, maybe uh, on a Saturday afternoon, you come to my house, we have cafecito, and we invite two more teachers, and we just speak English because I want to learn from you. People like when you, when they feel flattered when, when they hear that you want to learn from them. But actually, deep inside, you know that you also have something to teach. And, and, the, and the funny thing is that, again, everybody has something to contribute. Everybody has something to give. Um, uh, opa. Everybody has something to provide. When, when, when you meet with somebody who speaks better English than you, because you have that, people who speak really good English, and when I say better English, I'm talking probably about grammar, about pronunciation, about fluency, about vocabulary. And you meet with that person to discuss a book, okay? So you read a book together, or you read the same book, or you read different books, and you talk about books. And then that person speaks better English than you do but you know more about books than that person does. 
and you you have more in depth analysis of of the book and more thoughtful and meaningful ideas than that person and then that person smoothly understands that and starts liking that conversation because it is again mutual learning but if it is a group of three that is a community of practice and then if you invite one more teacher that's four and then that's five and then that could be between or amongst the the english teachers and one day the science teacher looks at that and says hey why don't you invite me uh, I, I, I speak English, I teach science, but I studied in a private school and I want to practice my English. So you start involving more people in your community of practice. So that is a good way of starting uh, in, a, in a, what, non-intentional, but intentional way, if, if, if I may say so. It's like, you don't have to say, let's create a community of practice. Although the principal of the school or the director of, of, of of or the academic coordinator might say, "Hey guys, let's 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 create a community of practice. Let's start uh, with sharing materials or creating materials because in that part, I mean, in in every single aspect of teaching and learning, we have something to learn and we have something to give. Okay. Uh, for example, myself, me as a teacher, I really suck at creating materials." especially when we talk about uh, handcrafts and cutting and pasting, but there are teachers who are like artists, real artists in creating materials. So I would benefit a lot from somebody who can do, who can do that and teach me how to do that and, and, and create materials together. And then we both would have good materials because so, those are challenges that we have, real challenges. Um, Anna, Anna Campos before uh, me, she mentioned challenges with technology, with, with, the, with the education gaps that we have. And to be honest, for me, those are like huge challenges. But there are like smaller challenges that we have on a daily basis, like the lack of resources. And sometimes what we have is lack of communication because the teacher in preschool, maybe she is a master in creating you know, resources and I never talk with her because I am the high school teacher who teaches 11th grade and I am really cool. So I don't need to talk with the preschool teacher. When I put my arrogance away, when I put my, you know, my cockiness away and I become humble and I talk to the preschool teacher and say, hey, look, I've seen the, the beautiful things you do with the children. Can we do something for the high schoolers? And she goes like, oh, sure. But I noticed that you like have like really nice activities. Can we do? Activities, can we modify activities for preschool? So we are creating communities of practice. Um, yeah, so um, there are multiple, multiple ways of, of starting a community of practice. What else, Romy? Okay, we have some more comments. Um, Melissa Gonzalez says, Right now, there are online communities all around the world because many teachers of different parts of the world are struggling with distance teaching. It's worthy to learn from other countries. They make us see things with different glasses. Also, Daniela Fernandez says uh, it's a great yeah, topic. Uh, uh, yeah, hold, hold on to that one. Just, just because I want to like pick back on one. that one. Yeah. Uh, there are, as I said, local, national, and international communities. There are communities of teachers with 3,000 teachers. And it's so great because uh, you are looking for a book and you just say, hey, who has that book in PDF? And they, in, in, in five minutes, you have the book in PDF. Uh, I am writing a thesis and I need a topic for my thesis in, in linguistics in, you know, social linguistics in what, and, and in 10 minutes you have somebody contacting you, telling you, look, here you can find this. So yeah, totally agree with that comment. International communities of practice help a lot. National communities of practice help a lot. Local communities of practice help a lot. So thank you. Sorry, um, Romy, go ahead.
One more comment is from Daniela Fernandez. She says, it's a great topic. I'm going to do my teaching practicum and it will help me to work with the in-service teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I already said Melissa Gonzalez, right? Online mm -hmm. communication all around the world because many teachers of different parts are struggling with distance teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, there are too many comments for you. <laughs> Mariana Ortiz says, we do it in our major classes. Our classmates comment, comment what they could make better. Uh, Judy Mora says, I think a community of practice is not just a club of friends or a network of connection between people. It has an identity. Um, defined by a shared interest. Therefore, I believe it implies a commitment to the domain. Yeah, and actually, uh, just, just to pick back on, on, on the one that says it's not just a group of friends or a club of friends, that yeah. is a difference. That is exactly the difference between a group of friends and a community of practice. Uh, you know, a group of friends, usually you know get together for common interest also but they don't, don't they don't nurture their knowledge mutually the difference the difference between a community of teacher of, of teachers is that they mutually nurture their knowledge that is what makes the difference so working in the same high school does not make you a member of a community of teachers working in the same university does not make you a member of a community of teachers. You are only a member of a community of teachers if you are part of a group that is working for the progress in terms of linguistic knowledge, in terms of pedagogical knowledge, in terms of language knowledge, in terms of a teaching, general teaching knowledge, helping each other grow. That's what makes you a member of a community of teachers, not just working in a high school with five more teachers, 10 more teachers, and then you sit in the lounge to have cafecito and talk about Saprisa and La Liga and who won. That is not at all a community of teachers. A community of teachers sit together and discuss a book. They talk about the book, they talk about uh, a movie, they talk about, or they talk about even uh, classroom challenges, a problem, they talk about a student who is struggling and, and, and you should see, uh, or maybe you have seen that before. The beauty of, 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 community, of a community of teacher, when, when I sit with Tobias and Romy and I tell, tell them, look, I am really concerned with, uh, I don't know, Pablo, Pablito is a fake name, Pablito, because Pablito is not, attending my classes, if he attends my classes, he's not paying attention, and I think he's being a little bit lazy, or maybe I'm using words like heavy, or like maybe he's not responsible. And then Romy and, and, and Tobias tell me, Jose, Pablito, did you know that he just uh, had a, a loss, that he lost a family member, blah, 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 uh, something that I ignored. So a community of practice, and this is not gossip. We need to make the difference between gossip and, 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 and feedback and useful feedback. Because for me, as a teacher, it is important and it is crucial to know my students at a deeper level. So when, when we sit together to talk about classroom problems and they tell me that a student is struggling with a fam family problem, with a, a personal problem that helps me help the student, in my next meeting or whenever I see the student again. But if I don't know that, then I might be probably uh, missing the point when I evaluate or when I assess the student's uh, behaviors in my classroom. So totally agree with, with the comment that it's not a group of friends. It's, it's a group of, 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 of members working for the mutual progress of, of everybody. Thank you, Mr. Jose Cerdas. We really appreciate your wonderful ideas. Uh, thank you for always saying yes to the UNED community. 
you know, uh, the practices that we do, all the things that we, the projects, we, you always say, yes, Tobias, I am here. So we want to thank you for your help, your effort and everything you do for us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Have a good night, everybody. You too.